Hey, this is Andrew Smith, and I'm here with my English 1020 students, and they're about to interview me about Bonnaroo. Uh, the woman in the mask is my student, Haley. Haley, you want to start your questions? Okay. Uh, so after just doing a little bit of research, uh, could you describe Bonnaroo in a nutshell? So Bonnaroo is a music festival that began around the beginning of the 21st century in Manchester, Tennessee, which is a rural community between Nashville and Chattanooga, and it is a all-encompassing camping festival modeled after um, the festivals in uh, in England uh, that started in the early uh, 1970s, like Glastonbury. And so an all-inclusive camping festival means that you, you live in a different society. You live in the society of the festival. You don't go back to your hotel room or your personal home at night. You stay in your, your tent or your RV or whatever, and you become a part of this community. It's a multi-stage, uh, multi-genre music festival. Um, that attempts to radiate positivity through great music. And I've been going on and off since 2006, and it's about an hour and a half from my house to get to the festival, and it is probably one of the best festivals in North America. And if I was a big, you know, golf fan and the Masters was, a, you know, within a drive from my house, if I, you know, if the Titans were, you know, had free tickets, you know, and they were playing for the championship, you know, I might want to go there if I was a football fan. If you're a music fan and you live in Tennessee or even in the Southeast, you are attracted uh, to uh, Bonnaroo. Uh, on the main stage headliners, they will have whatever the top artists are in all of popular music at that time. It originally began as a jam band festival uh, influenced by the Grateful Dead and the Fish communities, and also as a classic rock festival. So you would see bands like Pearl Jam, U2, uh, Bruce Springsteen, um, The Police, uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, but it's moving away from that classic rock identity into a more uh, youth-oriented festival every year. I, I appreciate it. It's The Fish. I actually know a teeny bit about them. So that's cool. Um, what is the draw for you? So. Music is my is my self care. I know before we started recording, we, we as a group were talking about music and festivals as self care and also mental health and also as a form of spirituality. So I started going to concerts when I was in middle school, and it's my favorite hobby. And I have many many hobbies, but attending live music is my favorite hobby. And I love to dance. Um, I'm actually a spinner. That's somebody who twirls around in circles while they listen to music. And I'm also sober from drugs and alcohol. I used to be a, a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I got sober in 2009. And I went to Bonnaroo with uh, 40 days of sobriety. And I found an organization there called the Yellow Balloon Community, and they have 12-step support meetings during the music festival for other music fans like myself who have recovered from addiction but are not interested in giving up the music addiction. And so it is, it's really um, helped me grow my recovery. I've made friends all over the country who are 12-steppers who go to rock concerts, and they came out of a 12-step movement in the Grateful Dead scene from the 1980s called the Wharf Rats, and I'm now I'm a Wharf Rat. I got a, a Wharf Rat t-shirt. I got my my engraved uh, Wharf Rat sobriety coin every year. Actually, I might be able to show you guys one. Um, so it's my community. It is a, a beautiful place uh, to go uh, with your friends. And, um, and, and the camping aspect for an older guy like myself is really hard. I like my comfort, you know, um, but it is a way to kind of stretch your, um, your boundaries and your abilities, you know. So I started, I don't know, about seven years ago, I started getting a custom coin. Uh, for every anniversary. Um, this whole um, little thing here is a, a basket of old um, key tags and coins. This is my eight-year coin. My 10-year, my 10-year coin. Here's my, here's my seven-year coin. I'm going to be picking up my 12-year here in a few days. And uh, I thought when I quit drinking, that fun was over. You know, I was gonna become the most boring old fuddy-duddy and to know that I could go and get my dance on um, with a bunch of other music people. And I could see people doing the things that I used to do, like passing out and blacking out. And, you know, that's the worst because you don't remember the concert, right? I remember the concert, I have tons of energy because I still exercise and I drink a lot of coffee. So I'm like, I'm like this little, like, you know, little kid, you know, imagine like a 10 year old kid in his happy place. Um, so it's community as well as um, the music. But I go for the music. I go there for um, seeing some of the best shows of my life. I'm getting choked up just talking about it. I will cry. I will ugly cry at a good Bonnaroo um, set. Uh, uh, Brandy, Car Brandy Carlisle was probably my last um, ugly cry. She wrote a whole album about forgiveness and about acceptance. And 
you were talking about being conservative Christians, not liking Bonnaroo. She's a very spiritual folk singer, but she sings about being a lesbian mom. And she's got this great song that she wrote for her daughter. Uh, she has another song about a gay kid getting bullied. Um, it's just, just a beautiful uh, singer songwriter. So I, I, every time I go to Bonnaroo, I have a, I have a spiritual experience, but uh, Brandy Carnell was one that I had at the most recent Bonnaroo I went to, which was two years ago. Of course they didn't have it last year, um, which is very disappointing. That's really awesome. It makes me want to know more about it. Um, okay, so Justin Bailey had a really interesting article he wrote for Music in Minnesota, where, he, first of all, he mentioned that uh, Bonnaroo is a religious experience, which I think you've definitely covered here. But then he also says, uh, many attendees of Bonnaroo consider the event a way of life. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, how does it affect your life? So going back to the main question then, and I'll go, I'll go on to this one, and I'll segue right directly into it, on this whole question of, of religion and spirituality in Bonnaroo. Um, I believe in God. So when I refer to my higher power, I'm referring to God in the sense that most people mean God is the creator of the universe. And the way that God makes contact with us is through beauty and uh, joy and wonder. And so there's few more wondrous things than the choir, you know, singing at church. And uh, so for this unchurch, you know, for this unchurch of Bonnaroo, the, the bands are kind of like the choir. And there's something, I heard one of your classmates mention serotonin, something triggers in the human, human chemistry that they um, un unleash their more mystical and spiritual and cosmic feelings while listening to music and dancing, both the physical act of dancing and what the, what the song does to your head and to your heart. Um, so I would definitely endorse uh, the kind of idea of, of Bonnaroo as a, as a religion. And this idea about a way of life. So there's several things. First of all, um, sedentary humanity is a new thing. So our ancestors in North America, the indigenous that were here, many of them were settled peoples and they had something resembling a kind of civilization. But some of the um, indigenous um, uh, bands and tribes were actually nomadic year round and they traveled at all times. And in America, you have a great traveler culture. You have people who live in RVs full time. You have people called the van life culture. You have people who, um, great hobo, old fashioned hobo tradition, train hoppers, hitchhikers. And so for young people who are, we talked about gap years, you know, in an earlier unit this semester, Haley. So for a young person who's taking a, a couple of gap years uh, to become a nomad or a traveler is a very popular thing. And so some young people get jobs working at festivals. Um, they have a beautiful, beautiful also, Kind of underground economy in the in the parking lot that descends from the Grateful Dead culture called Shakedown Street, so people can make um, food and handicrafts, and you can go out there and sell T-shirts, and so you can actually make a living to support yourself and spend your whole summer. So there are young people today who are in it for the 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 big the big picture. So they'll have a, a business maybe in the back of their van or in their trailer, or maybe they'll even have a food truck, and they'll travel to festivals all summer long, um, and they'll get to enjoy the music, but they'll also um, earn an income at the same time. And when I first found out about Bonnaroo, I was so excited. But at that time in my life, I thought $300 for a concert, I'm never going to pay $300. Well, the last couple of years, we, we went VIP, so we paid almost $2,000 for our ticket. But back then, we were like, no way. We're, you know, we, were, we were a little bit more like, I had a little bit more street cred when I was 35 than I do when I'm almost 55. So, so we, we got on the, on the, we got a job at Bonnaroo. It was a volunteer job, but we were staff. We were Bonnaroo staff. And I was a Bonnaroo staff person for uh, many years. And we staffed a tent called the Academy, which was a, a learning center in the, um, inside of the Bonnaroo. And we brought tech professors and also friends. We had hula hoop classes, acting classes. I taught a poetry class in Bonnaroo. We had uh, gardening, organic gardening classes, all kinds of sustainability classes. Um, in there. So yes, uh, um, well, what does Bonnaroo do to the, my life? I believe that that joy and happiness are contagious, um, and I believe they're a choice. Um, so I believe I choose to live in a joyful, positive attitude about my fellow human beings and on my, my attitude towards life in general, um, and Bonnaroo encourages that. It's kind of like a plateau. It's like going to church camp when you were a kid. If you ever went to church camp and you had like a mystical experience, you know, with singing or Jesus or whatever, and then you get home and you're like, well, gosh, I wish it could be church camp all year long. Now, it can't be. And those, those are called mountaintop experiences or peak experiences. Those are only real because they aren't every day, right? Um, they, they're time out of time. The, the definition of the holy and the sacred is something that is set aside. Um, and I do believe that everything that God made is holy and sacred, but there's things that are, I guess, a little bit more sacred, hyper sacred or whatever, the holy of holies. Bonnaroo of Stars Music Festival is gold is the inner sanctum. It's the holy of holies. It's like the, it's the top shelf. It's the, the top rung of the ladder as far as that goes. Thank you.
And then uh, the last thing is I, I know that there's even Christians who will go like with signs and like just completely condemn the event. So uh, what would you want to say to them? Read your Bible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, was right. Jesus, what was Jesus's first miracle in the Gospel of John? He created water into wine at a wedding feast. And this was um, not according to the, but I'm not a Bible scholar. I do study the Bible. I'm a Christian. I've worked in churches before, but I don't consider myself a Bible expert. I consider myself a fairly well-trained lay, lay person who has been assigned to preach from time to time. So uh, the scholars tell me that that was a massive quantity of wine. It was like, not like a couple of glasses. He made like a couple of kegs, several multiple, multiple large vessels full of wine and that they got wasted. And then also, I think one of the accusations thrown at Christ by the, you know, the religious leaders of his time and by, by kind of the negative Nancy's, but the, you know, by the uh, Debbie Downers of his time was he's a glutton and a fool. He hangs out with sinners and prostitutes. So Jesus was kind of punk rock or hippie or whatever. You know, I think Jesus was the first hipster as is that we would understand that. So I would encourage them to read their Bible. I would encourage them to look at themselves and wonder, is Jesus inviting all of us into a new world or is Jesus simply trying to be a rule keeper? You know, and I, I do understand that sin and evil are real, but I think the, um, the, the variety of evangelical that shout at kids going to Bonnaroo, I wonder if there's something else at play there that emotionally or psychologically in their background that has caused them to, to project their religion so negatively. And, um, as somebody who's been told that I'm not a real Christian because I accept LGBT persons, I don't want to tell somebody else that they're not a real Christian. But the Jesus that I've met in my most intimate moments is not a Debbie Downer. He's a happy cat. He's having a good old time. And Jesus is a Jesus, is a, is, is a Jesus of joy. So I think they're really... They're really bad PR for the faith, to be honest with you. I'm not, I don't have a, actually, to be quite honest with you, Haley, now that I'm not working at, at a church anymore, I have very little tolerance for that, that, that particular brand of hypocrisy because I think it does, I think it's toxic Christianity and I think it harms, it harms the gospel and the good work of the kingdom. So to be quite blunt about it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for helping us here. Uh, that was so much fun and I'm going to make a video. We're making a video. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>